Hello, good morning and welcome back to On The Hook. My name is John Locker and I'm fishing from my 17 foot boat on the south coast of Cornwall and it is an incredibly flat day. You do not get many days like this out here. My plan today is that I'm going to go and try and find some bait first of all. Sand eels, pilchards, lawns, anything like that. Ideally, some lawns, some big sand eels. I'm going to fish with live sand eels and lows over an area of reef. And then when the tide drops off, I'm going to go and anchor up on some sand and fish at anchor on some sand. Just an easy day's fishing on this beautiful day at sea. As usual, I will explain all the rods, the rigs, the tactics, everything like that as I do it. Just wish me luck. Let's go. I don't know how well you can see it, but a fog is blowing in. Gone from being able to see all the way at the horizon, best part of what, 10 mile. Now we'll grow about 400 meters of visibility and it's going to get worse. Very small, whatever it is. <laughs> well, I said it was small. Tide's just picking up. Like we've, we've just passed low water now. Tide's picking up. So hopefully if I can pick up some bait now, in like the next half an hour, that gives me the best part of the tide to fish with the lures and fish with the live baits. And as the tide starts to drop off again towards high tide, I'll go and anchor up. Yay! That is what we're after. Yeah, if I get myself a dozen sand eels, I will be over the moon. That also shows me, the size of that sand eel there, shows me how big, how big my lures need to be. Because there's predator fish around, if, if all of the bait fish is that big, then using a lure that's 8 inches long isn't going to catch them. Whereas if all the bait fish are 6 inches long, and my lures are 6 inches long, kind of like match the hatch isn't it? Hey, I tell you what, that, that doesn't feel like a sand eel. Yeah, I thought as much. Thought that didn't feel like a sand eel. There we have a male cuckoo ras and a female cuckoo ras. So you can immediately see the difference in the two of them, can't you? The striking differences between the males and the females. Yeah, these, these males here, I think, personally, I think they're one of the best looking fish in the UK. Absolutely stunning, aren't they? Now, we am fishing in 40 metres of water. I did, bring them, I did bring them up slowly, but I think they might need a minute or two to go back down. They should write him where she's gone back, perfect. He just needs a minute or two to rest himself. Let's loop back round. Well, that fog's cleared up nicely. It literally, it blew in, it got really dark, really cold, and it just as quickly it's blown back out again. And we might see a little bit more of it later because it is sat on the horizon over there again. What I'm doing now is I'm out to try and catch as many sand eels as I can. Like I say, if I can get a dozen of them, I'll be very happy. Because I'll use them as live baits, drifting over a reef. And then after that, I'll use them as baits at anchor. As James, my little boy, would say, one is better than none. The hooks that I'm using, I'm using a set of sabikis. Now they are really small hooks, I think they're like size 12 or 14. Oh, that's more like it. Yeah, like I was saying, the, uh, the sabiki rig that I've got 
the hooks are like size 14. You might have noticed there as I was unhooking them, some of them were just pinging straight off the hooks. And that's because I've crushed the barbs on the hooks. Because I'm going to be using these fish as bait, I don't. Oh, hello. Because I'm going to be using these fish as bait, I don't want them to be. As, I don't want them to be damaged. I want them to be as alive as possible. This feels more like a mackerel. So to make it easier to unhook. Yes, it is a mackerel. There you go. To make them easier to unhook, I crush the barbs on the hooks. That also means that if I hook something that I don't want to keep, so something that's too small, then it doesn't damage it. All I have to do is turn the hook upside down and it falls off. But yeah, these sabikis, because they've got really small hooks and because the line's really light, you're better off fishing fishing with them with a lighter rod, with a, with a rod with a supple tip like this one. If you use like a 30-50, something that's got a real stiff tip in it you find it doesn't cushion the bite like this one here this rod this is a solid carbon a regiment 3 solid carbon 20 to 30 and it has got a lovely supple tip in it there, look. so you'll notice that when i was playing them fish up all of the lunges of the fish were taken out in the rod which means you don't pull the hooks out if your drag's too tight or your rod's too stiff what happens is instead of bending, it just twangs and you'll find that you're ripping the hooks out of the fish, especially when you've got barbless hooks on, like I have. So yeah, having a rod with a supple tip, just a little bit of housekeeping. <laughs> having a rod with a supple tip is better when you're fishing for bait. See what I mean about how the supple tip bends over into the fish? So every single time it lunges or, or bangs or fights, When you're doing this, when you come to unhooking stuff, when you're fishing by yourself, the best thing you can do is keep hold of the lead. And that way it keeps... If you keep hold of the lead, like this, it keeps them all stretched out. It stops your rig from falling all on top of itself and tangling up. And all you do is work your way along like a washing line, unhooking them. There we are. Live sand eel, sliding float. This gives you some type of an example of what I was talking about as well. I mean, like, if this is what they're down there feeding on, and these are the lures that I'm using, there's not too much of a difference, is there? Run a couple of drifts up and down this reef and see if there's any fish around. And my spinning rod is just a conflict inshore and I've got a slammer four, three and a half, no, <laughs> a slammer four, four and a half thousand. The type of bite that we're looking for with the float is a positive bite, it's for it to go straight under. Also, you can get a drop back bite, being this. Sometimes because, because the float will sit cocked, being that it's stand upright in the water. If a fish picks up the bait and the weight and swims towards the surface, the float can lay flat. didn't take long. Float just went straight down. The way it's banging its head, it feels like a bass. Oh no, just a nice puller.
there you go that was it that was how simple the rig was where's your hook where's the hook oh it's not that far down yeah but that's that's a nice little pollock that in fact I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to take a fillet off him the hook isn't that far inside of him in fact there we go look there's the hook yeah I am I'm going to take this one for the table super super simple rig just a sliding float a locked in lead a hook length of around about is that two and a half to three feet and that's ending in a, an 8 0 cox and roll chino and all I've done was I just took one of the took one of the lawns and just passed the hook into it now that fish there that pollock didn't fight like a pollock it fought like a bass pollock generally have like a crashing dive and bass shake their head around that one was shaking its head about and didn't really dive The rod and the rig that I'm using for my float, it's an Abu Veritas and it's a Pen Fierce 4000. And the only reason why I'm using this over my other spinning rod is this is slightly longer. And when you're fishing with a float, it's easier sometimes to have it slightly higher so the line's not too, not too low around the boat. That's, that's literally the only reason. The only reason why I'm using that rod rather than the other one is just because that one's a little bit longer. The area of reef that we are running over is rocky and kelpy and anything between 15 to 27 metres deep. So I've set my float as shallow as the shallowest part. There's no point, if, you, if you're in anything from like 15 to 30 metres, there's no point setting it at 25 metres because at the shallowest part you're just going to snag up. So you've got to fish it to the shallowest part. So I've set it up about 15 metres. Oh, that was a big fish and a very small lure. I put on a little tiny spinner. <laughs> that was a big fish and a little lure. A little bit bent on one of them. Yeah, I'm thinking that was a big balandras. I've just put a little metal spinner on. Just to get me down to the seabed. Yeah, I just dropped all the way at the bottom and literally first bounce was, was banging to a fish. I think it was a big balandras. I knew I couldn't bully it because of the size of the hooks. Just try to gradually lift it up and just... Nah, it's gone. You win some, you lose some. Doesn't seem to be an awful lot on this reef. I'll carry on this drift for about another 100 yards. And we'll try and put the anchor down. We can always try this reef on the way back. Might be a mackerel. Well, the fish is a fish, I'm glad to see it. Nice one as well. Yeah, 
There's another one. I've put the anchor down for a couple of hours now just because the tide's slacking right off. I've just got my rods out and all I've done there is I've filleted off some of the sand I got earlier and I've mounted them on like two O's and three O's. See how big they are? Hook lengths, two and a half to three feet long and it's either a locked in rolling lead. So as in one of them little... Ooh, where have, we? have we got one? I've got one kicking about. So one of these leads, just like a locked in lead, but it's so it'll roll. And all I've done is I've just cast them around, just, just because not only do I want to cover as much area as possible. If I cast all four baits out of the bottom, they'd probably cover an area of about 20 meters. Whereas if I cast one out that side, one out that side, one out that side, that's, I'm covering a greater area. Also, as the boat is swinging around a little bit with the wind, if all your lines are close together, they just get tangled up. So try and keep them apart. And I'm fishing just a light drag. I'm looking for a bite. Now all of these rod tips, these are almost tight. So you will see a bite on these. We're looking for anything that's going to be moving through the area. Could be a gurnard, could be a dogfish, could be a ray, could be a cord, could be a bass, could be, could be anything. There's a bite as well. Turn me back on that and it went. Dogfish. Not what I'm after, but I'll gladly take them. I'm going to unhook this, put it in a tub, and I'll sort it out in a minute. But it's just pooped all over my shoe. Okay. Don't want to turn me turn me back on that other rod because if it's a ray, when they turn round and they run off, they can take the rod with them. They're bad for <laughs> they're bad for being sick dogfish. That's why when he come when I brought him on board, the first thing I did was I just hung, hung him over the side. Now they are very rough, they're very abrasive. I'll show you the unhooking of that in a second, but yeah, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rebait and I'm gonna cast out. But you notice with this rod, I fished it on the ratchet, meaning that I put the clicker on so that if any line leaves it goes as an audible alarm. So that when I had my back to it, I still heard when I had a bite, because it went like... Anyway, let's get another bait out. The dogfish is still in that barrel down there. I make up three or four other hook lengths so that I can pre-bait hook lengths. I can have two or three made up and baited like this. Look, that's just the side of a sand ale. So all I need to do is when I bring one in, like that dogfish, instead of fighting with it and letting it writhe around and cause all the drama, just unclip the hook length, put it down in the barrel, clip on another one, and cast back out. Because now I can be back fishing, back fishing in no time at all. Instead of wasting time unhooking the rebaiting and all that sort of, you lose two, three, four, five, in, sometimes even ten minutes if it's, a, if it's an awkward hook hold. If that's ten times over a session, you've lost an hour of fishing time. So just by spending two or three minutes making up a couple of hook things and pre-baiting them, it could mean the difference of two or three more fish by the end of the session. Now, now, that, I've, now that I've sorted myself out, now that I've cast back out, what they'll try and do is their skin is like sandpaper. They'll try, no matter where I get hold of him, he'll try and bring his tail up 
to try and get hold of me, look. And they rub their tail on you and they scrub your skin off, just like that. So what you need to do is you need to hold on to their tail and their head at the same time. Like that. I've got hold of his head and his tail. So no matter how much he tries to writhe around like that, he can't scratch me with his skin. And then all you do is you just take the hook out. Pooping again. It's like a defense mechanism for him. You know, like when you pick up a frog and it weighs itself. Like that with doggies. Apart from doggies are usually sick or they poop. It works so you put them down sharp enough afterwards, don't you? <laughs> this is why. Hoofing great spider crab. Walloping great male spider crab. Now I'd had a couple of bites that were a little bit strange. Just like a peck and then it just slowly walked off. And this is the reason why. Because if there's a few of these guys down there. I mean he's, he's big enough to take, he'd be. <laughs> That's... That's an alright size eating, eating spider crab. Also, if I throw him straight back over, all he's going to do is he's going to go straight down on my baits again. So I'm going to keep hold of him. But yeah, that's why it didn't give me a very good bite. <laughs> and no fight at all, just a solid weight. So far, four dogfish and a spider crab. That's the third spider crab I've had. Give me 10 more minutes in this spot and then we'll go somewhere else. I have I have got a camera down on the seabed just to have a look what it's like and I'm guessing <laughs> it's just going to be dogfish and spider crabs. I'll sort myself all out, get a load of new baits ready. If we haven't had another bite by then we'll pull the anchor up and we'll go somewhere else. Because it's not working here. Now the camera hadn't been down on the seabed for more than 30 seconds before the first one arrived. And then it was just one after another. Oh, hello. There's your dogfish. These guys are just following me around today. He's a lot darker than the ones I was catching out on the sand. In fact, every single dogfish that I've caught today has been a male. You can tell it's a male by those, let me just, by these claspers here. Yeah, no matter where I go, it just seems to be dogfish. <laughs> ah. What can you do? Another one. This makes six. It's getting beyond a joke now. I fish these last baits out because it just seems to be that everywhere I go today <laughs> it's dogfish and spider crabs. I've got another one on this rod here, look. Again, a little poopy male. Always, but always needs loads of cleaning after you've caught a load of dogfish. Very messy fish. Oh look, another male dogfish. I promised you it's not just a, <laughs> it's not just the same one. Ah, well, that is that. I have had enough. 
I've still got two baits, so I'll, I'll pull them in in a second. We've we finished the day. I did keep I did keep the big spider crab, and I have got some some wonderful pollock fillets. And I've had a lovely day at sea, despite the hordes and hordes of dogfish. I have got a camera on the seabed here in this location as well, but I'm expecting it's just going to show more of these and more dogfish. We're right on this one. Let's have a look. See what's going on. Yep, different area, but still more spider crabs. This clip is sped up, but it shows you just how many hermit crabs are running around on the ground. Oh, and there's your dogfish. And his mate. I hope you've enjoyed joining me. I hope you found it interesting. All the very best. See you later.